Church, we want to give you a really warm welcome as you join us for this morning's service. If you're regular to Skylark Church Online or whether you're part of the Skylark International Movement, or if you're just tuning in for the first time, we want to give you a really warm welcome as you join us for Church Online. You know, our prayer more than anything is that as you hear today's message and you join us for worship, is that wherever you are, that the peace and the presence of God would flood wherever you are, whether it's you're in your lounge, whether you're on the train to work, Wherever you're watching us, may the goodness and peace and presence of God flood your room. So we're going to kick off with some worship now. I'm going to hand over to the worship team. But hey, isn't it great to worship God together online? We're going to hand over to those guys now.
Good morning, Skylark Church. I'm Terry. And I'm Eddie. And our favourite parable is the parable of the mustard seed. I just love the fact that you can have the smallest, tiniest little bit of faith and God can grow it into something incredible and huge. Love you all. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Hi, Skylark Church. My name is Mary. My favourite parable in the Bible is the Good Samaritan, found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. In it, Jesus teaches us to show love, compassion and kindness to our neighbours and strangers. Hey, Skylark Church, it's Sam and Emily Parker here. One of our favourite parables is the parable of the prodigal son. It's such an important reminder that nothing or no one is ever lost and you're always loved in God's eyes. And that's why we love it so much. Bless you all. See you soon, hopefully. Have a great day. Ciao for now. Thank you, worship team. It's just amazing how each week you lead us so beautifully. And we want to thank the team that have just put so much time and effort into that and the guys behind the scenes that knit this all together we are so grateful for you and it's just awesome to be able to worship and lift the name of jesus on high together so thank you so much and aren't the skylark spotlights awesome isn't it great to see people from the skylark family and to hear how they're connecting we love hearing from people and hearing what people are doing and how they're connecting with us earlier this week uh, the prime minister addressed the nation and told us about what the next few months may look like and some of the restrictions that have been put in place. And as a church, we are very much praying for our nation and what is happening with COVID. So one of the things that we are gonna be doing now is lifting up our NHS workers, our healthcare workers, and all those that are on the front line. We know that the weeks ahead are gonna be challenging. And so we're just gonna pray that God's peace and God's grace and mercy would fill our land and we're going to pray right now. So I'm going to ask Nash if she would lead us in praying for our healthcare workers. And then after Nash has prayed, there'll be a few screens with some updates for you to have brought to your attention. Heavenly Father, I start this prayer, Lord, by saying thank you. Thank you for being that true number one consistent occurrence in our day to day and everyday lives. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for your kindness. During these times of uncertainty, during these times of distrust and turbulence, Lord, I pray that you provide a stillness, a calmness, a protective peace over each and every one of us. In particular, Lord, for those who work within the healthcare sector. I pray, Lord, that you could grant them with the wisdom and the knowledge that they had prepared themselves for. I ask you, I ask Lord that you have a protection over each and every one of them working so, so hard in order to serve you and to serve and protect the public. Keep them safe, Lord. Keep them nourished, keep them with strength and wisdom during these times of such uncertainty and a global pandemic lord i pray a safety and a barrier over each and every one of people working so hard amen
There is a couple of online courses that we want to make you aware of for the weeks ahead. Um, as a church, we often run the marriage course. Now, clearly, we can't meet at Skylark Church, but what we are going to be doing is running the course online. So it's going to be seven weeks. And to know more about this course and what it entails, then please speak to Nigel or Claire Parker via email, which I believe is below me. Or you can book on Church Suite for all the details. We're also really excited about a new course called Parenting for Faith, and this is going to be running across the Skylark International Network family. The whole point of this course is to equip families to raise kids in faith and to get a deeper understanding and connection with God. And Lindsay Wells, our Skylark Kids pastor, is going to be facilitating this. Now, this course isn't just for parents or grandparents. It's for anyone that works with kids, whether that's foster carers, grandparents, it is open to anyone that is connected and working with kids. So again, if you contact Lindsay Wells on the email below, she will be able to give you more info on that. So two exciting courses that we're really excited to be able to share with you. All that is left for me now to do is to introduce our guest speaker for you this morning. I have known Bev Merrill since I was 14 years old, so a fair few years. But in all that time, I have known Bev to be a dynamic communicator, someone passionately in love with Jesus, someone that is passionate about fighting injustice. So as we hand over to Bev this morning, I know that you'll be encouraged, you'll be inspired, and I know it's a word that's gonna challenge us. So I'm gonna hand over to Bev Murrell now. Good morning, Skylark. Lovely to have the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, yeah, I wanna to talk to you today about what it is to share Jesus. I know you've been taking that as a process and uh, yeah it's my blessing to be able to talk to you about what it is to share him now i probably need to start by saying that i despised christians before i was one i was brought up in a methodist school my family weren't christian but i know my mum believed in god uh, but you know i came to a place where i just looked down on christians my big sister was a christian and um i yeah, I was looking for answers, but I had given up on looking for answers with God. And then he presented himself to me in the most amazing way. And so I became a Christian and everything began to change on the inside of me, not necessarily straight away on the outside, but on the inside. And the thing that I had the most difficulty with was that because I despised Christians before, because I thought they were weak, because I thought they needed a crutch and all the rest of it, I found it really difficult then to tell people that I was one. And so I, I couldn't talk to them about Jesus. I wanted to. I really knew that Jesus was the answer, but I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. I didn't know uh, how I was going to you know, bring them to know Jesus. And so it was really tough and I felt really um, embarrassed in front of God. I'd read that scripture that says, if you can't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father in heaven. And I was frightened because I thought, well, I, I am a Christian, but I just find it so hard to talk about you, Lord. And and I, I prayed about it for a lot. That went at least over the first 18 months that I was a Christian, maybe more. And I used to pray about it a lot. How am I going to share you, Lord, when I'm embarrassed to share you? So I don't know what how I'm going to do that. And one day I was sitting reading my Bible, and it was a Bible that my sister had given me, which isn't much in use now, but then it was called the Living Bible. And it's amazing to me how Lord can speak to you from different translations or in different ways, because he spoke to me out of 1 Corinthians verse 5, and I've looked in every other Bible, and it doesn't say anything like this in any of the other translations. But in the Living Bible, and it's burned into my memory, it says, He has helped you to speak out for Him and has given you full understanding of the truth. Now, the whole scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, says, He has enriched your whole life, which He really did. He has helped you speak out for Him and has given you a full understanding of the truth. What I told you Christ could do for you is what has happened. 
Now you have every grace and blessing, every spiritual gift and power for doing his will are yours during this time of waiting for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was a it was the first time the Lord ever spoke to me out loud, well, not actually out loud, but in the Bible. And uh, I was thunderstruck. I knew that particular line, he has helped you speak out for him and has given you a full understanding of the truth. Now, as it turns out, I don't even still have a full understanding of the truth. But, but I knew that God was saying to me, I am going to enable you to speak for me and you will speak on a large understanding. I'm going to enlarge your understanding, which was just amazing. And um, time went on and uh, Rick became a Christian and we were in a church that had adopted a plan. I think they'd bought it from some evangelist who developed it. And this plan had eight questions. And by the eighth question, you would be able to bring that person to say the sinner's prayer. And so we were all sent out. Our our entire church was sent out two by two to the region around us, the neighboring streets. And we had to knock on the door and go to people that we had never met before in our life. And we had to go through these eight questions. And the guarantee was by the time you get to the eighth one, that person will be saying the sinner's prayer. And so firstly, you had to introduce yourself. And of course, the man had to do the introductions because it was a guy, because we all know. Um, Anyway, I won't go into that. But um, we knocked on our first door and uh, (laughs) somebody came to the door and Rick said, hi, my name's Bev and this is my wife, Rick. And we were both stressed anyway. I just dissolved into laughter. And so, of course, he wanted to ask the first question is, can we come in and talk to you? And uh, the person was like, no way, and shut the door in our faces. It was just, it was embarrassing, but it's a really good story now. It was really funny. And Rick was saying to me, if you hadn't laughed, it would have been all right. But, of course, I did laugh because, you know, that's how it was. And... um And so that was one of our first forays into being able to speak about Jesus. And um, there's a saying by St. Francis of Assisi, which is a really cool saying, and it says, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now, actually, I think that that's the best piece of advice that we could ever get. I don't think we could really get anything more real to us because you know the bible actually says jesus says in matthew chapter 29 uh, sorry chapter 28 verse 19 he says therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit now we all think that you have to have a specific date and time in which you said the sinner's prayer with somebody else and that is the point that you became a Christian. But you know what? There's nothing in the Bible that says that. As a matter of fact, there isn't a sinner's prayer in the Bible. What happens is that Jesus is hanging out with different people and they're listening to him and at certain points he says to them, come and follow me and some of them make the decision to come and and follow him. Now, when I became a Christian... God had been speaking to me for a while in different ways. and um, But when I became a Christian, I was taking communion in an Anglican church. I'd had cancer. I had had a big operation. And I felt like God was calling me to go to church. And I did. It was, um, it was, Chris- it was a Christmas Eve service. And I went. I left a a Christmas party to go to church. I'd just come out of hospital and I was just like to Rick, I want to go to church. And so we went from there and I started to go to church every week and I was going to this Anglican church, not because I was Anglican, I was Methodist. I had never been confirmed, but they said, if anybody wants to take communion, come forward. And so I I had this longing and I used to go forward and take communion, not knowing it had to be confirmed. And obviously they were cool with that as well. And while I was kneeling, the Lord spoke to me and showed me this long road that I'd been walking up. It was a dark road. And I'd come to 
a a fork in the way and one I could I knew I could choose either direction and I knew that if I went the right way that it was God's way and as I just knelt there I said to the Lord I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life now I didn't know that I was supposed to say the sinner's prayer I didn't know that I was forgiven for my sins I didn't know a whole lot of stuff that we think is absolutely vital for somebody to know. All I knew was that Jesus was giving me an option and I decided to follow him. And that was absolutely massive. And I became a Christian that day. Now, I've been in churches since then where they quote the scripture that says, um, he who eats or drinks in a manner unworthy, you know, eats and drinks damnation to themselves. And so they say, if you're not a Christian, don't take communion. I'm like, if you're not a Christian, you're not going to heaven to be with Jesus anyway. So what difference is it going to make if you take communion or not? That scripture is written to people who are Christians, who should know better, who need to um, who need to do their forgiving, who need to do their repenting, who need to do their acknowledgement of their own sin. It's not written to non-Christians. And so I became a Christian taking communion without any other thing happening. And that was a really powerful thing. And so what I, I need to say is that I was discipled. That scripture I read to you before, go and make disciples. I was discipled a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, when I was going to work and I was about 17, there used to come a lady to my um, office window door. She used to come and bring some of the accounts. And sometimes if my boss wasn't there, she would stop and talk to me. Now, she was an old lady, except now I think back on it, she was about as old as me. But she used to talk to me. She never talked to me about Jesus. But I remember this feeling that I had when she talked to me it was a tangible physical feeling and I, it felt lovely i just felt this loveliness on the inside of me and then uh, not long after that i left that job and i went to uh, work in a smaller office and my boss was a salvation army guy and he was quite he, he was quite high up in the company and also in the salvation army but he used to go feeding the hungry or the homeless every friday night etc and he also never talked to me about Jesus. But when I was with him, I felt that same feeling. When we had conversations, I could feel that feeling. It was just an amazing feeling. And a long time after I became a Christian, there was a nail lady that I used to go to. Actually, it was in England. And she said to me, I don't know what it is, Bev, but every time I'm with you, I feel this feeling. Now, sometimes I used to talk to the to uh, the lady about the Lord and sometimes I didn't but I knew what she meant because I'd felt it too back in the day and so I think the thing that's most important for me to say to you is preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words it doesn't need us to go and say by the way do you know Jesus loves you by the way he can help you sort out your life by the way and now if you say this prayer, then you'll become a Christian. That isn't actually what he's asking us to do. He's asking us to be Christian. He's asking us to live as Christian. He's asking us to deliberately carry the kingdom of heaven wherever we go. And so that's a different thing altogether. If you read the book of Esther, that's an incredibly empowering book. But at no point of time is God's name mentioned. And yet God is with them, working with them all the way. And so, you know, the Bible says Jesus said, so in Isaiah and then also Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus says, um, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, set at liberty um, the captives, deliverance for the oppressed, um, sight to the blind. And then he says, today the gospel is fulfilled in your hearing. And he didn't say, say this in his prayer. He said the good news is about releasing the captives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so that's really, really powerful. Um, there's a, a lovely scripture, and I'm going to read it to you out, out of the Aramaic Bible uh, because it just gives a greater understanding. And it says, Or do you pres presume upon the wealth of his sweetness? 
and on his patience and on the place that he gave to you. He's, he's saying, don't presume on how great, on, on what he's doing in you. And then it goes on to say, do you not know that it's the sweetness of God that brings conversion to you? Now, in better known translations, it says, don't you know that it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance? And many times we see people out there preaching the gospel on the street. The brethren used to do that all the time. They didn't even interact with anybody. They just used to say, you're going to hell if you don't know Jesus. But it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And it's not ear bashing. I remember Pete Sims preaching several years ago about um, salt and the fact that we're the salt of the earth. And he got somebody forward, and it might have been Josiah Parr, but he brought somebody forward and he, no, it wasn't, it was Jonah. And he put a little bit of salt on something and gave it to him to eat, and it was tasty. And then he poured salt on it and he wanted the guy to, to eat it. But it was just too much salt there. He could not eat it. It was inedible and even it would be poisonous in those in those um, amounts. And I want to say to you that it's very legalistic to think that we have to air bash somebody and catch them at a party and keep talking about Jesus until they surrender or run away. And I did go through a place of legalism about Jesus and about Christianity before I understood that it's about who I be, not what I say, who I be to those people. When Francis said, you know, um, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words, you know, if we cover what we do with prayer, if we make God present in all we do, the words are just icing on the cake. I've got Micah chapter 6 verse 8 tattooed on my foot and it says, he's told you, O oh man, what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now if we do that, there's a kindness that will come out of us that will draw people to us. That's what happened to me very slowly over a period of time, months, months and months into years, people, Christian people, treating me with dignity and with love, forgiving me. Um, and so it's a really important thing for us to understand. We don't have to get people saved. We just have to preach the gospel in caring, in delivering the oppressed, in sight to the blind, in feeding the hungry. If we cover everything we do in a desire to bring the kingdom of God, the rest of it will work its way out. And it might take a while, but we will be the link in the chain. And that's all we need to do. We only be, need to be the link in the chain. There was a lot of links in the chain to bring Rick to know Jesus. Some of them talked to him about Jesus. Some of them were just a representation of Jesus in kindness and being in the opposite spirit. He came to know the Lord, not because somebody got him to say the prayer, but because they preached the gospel. And sometimes they use words, setting at liberty the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. It's always going to work a whole lot better. So, yeah, I want to encourage you. Who you are on the inside is what will come out, not what you've learned not trying to make people Christian, just being Christian to them. And that doesn't mean laying the law down. Jesus could have picked up that first stone and thrown it at that woman who committed adultery. He didn't. He stooped down in next to her and wrote in the dirt next to her. He aligned himself with her. And that's what made the difference. I think we should do that, hey? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord, that there is a sure, certain longing in their hearts to help people know your goodness and your kindness so that they can repent. I take authority over the legalism that says they have to preach to other people. I break the power of that in Jesus' name. And I pray for a release on each person to know that all they have to do is have you on the inside of them, front and center, 
with godliness and with grace, with prayer every morning to go out and be who you are in that vicinity. And whether they use your name or not, Lord, that people will be affected by that beautiful feeling, that beautiful scent to know who you are and to gradually begin to follow you, that out of our lives will come the voice of Jesus that says, follow me, and people will begin the journey that we have begun on to. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray. Amen. Bev, thank you so much for that inspiring message for us. We want to be good disciples, don't we? We want to love well and walk with that confidence knowing that we are kingdom carriers full of love and grace. So I'm going to end in prayer now and I'm going to pray that as we go about our week that we would have opportunities to share the good news, the message of Jesus, which is a message of hope, love, reconciliation and restoration. So why don't you join me as we close in prayer? Father God, we want to lift this morning to you. God, we just thank you for that message from Bev. Lord, how to be carriers of the kingdom. Jesus, we love you. What a privilege and an honour it is to serve you, to be a part of your kingdom. God, I pray as we go about our week this week, that Father, you would give us opportunities to share your love, your goodness. God, if it means being out of our comfort zones, then God, I thank you that you're always fully present and fully with us. So as we go about our weeks, may we know that you're at the centre of it all, that you love us and that you're with us. And we give glory to the holy, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining us this morning. May you have a blessed week full of opportunities, favour and great conversations. Big love to you all. Take care. See you next week. Step into a new